So um, I'm going to start by uh, linking uh, this the conversation to some of the things that I, I was mentioning actually in the uh, kickoff speech. Basically, it is a pretty complicated period for, for all of us. And for us as an organization, of course, uh, we had a lot of challenges to tackle on the short term. Uh, but ultimately, uh, these times did very little to change our vision, to change too much of our strategy, because as much of this was actually linked to a lot of concepts linked to digital transformation, uh, we found that to be solid and, and sticking for us for the long run. So in order to, to speak to you about what I think are some main of the, some of the key themes for, uh, for, for making, uh, making it through this period in a way that is sustainable, in a way that uh, actually sound decisions actually can be taken on uh, under the pressure of time, under the pressure market that we, uh, we're actually going through right now, I will start sharing with you some, uh, some of the things, main three things that actually we in ING, I think, um, have as a recipe uh, for that. First of all, I'm going to share with you some of uh, the data, some of the numbers, the big numbers against how we're actually performing. If you like those numbers, if you feel that there's something that proves that we are successful, then of course we're going to look at some other things like how we operate and how we innovate and eventually how all of this come together because operations, innovation at this point, I think need to well uh, play together in a way that actually ensure that the organization quickly adapts to the unpredictable environment that we have around, uh, ahead of us as well as are keeping true to what our promises to our customers, to our regulators, to our stakeholders across the world. So on this note, um, let's first restate a bit of the, the obvious facts to give a bit of the broader context. First of all, the name of the game, I think, is still the same for us. And we've actually really considered uh, the full implications of, of this period for, for us and our organization, but we still think that we need to stay through, through to the same statements that pretty much I was actually sharing with you, I think, uh, a year ago in the same context. First of all, our mantra is that of a technology company with a banking license. And maybe with more than a banking license, as you see that much of our strategy is actually moving into a platform concept. Digital in itself needs to be a platform game. We've all been discussing about the power of digital transformation to actually be able to help us transcend geographical boundaries as well as industry segments. And that is actually where, where the next step of this platform uh, is actually playing through. Whenever you're talking about platform, you need to put on a different hat, one that actually helps you consider the time to scale of your business strategies, of your business propositions, beyond just the mere time to market. That is actually a huge differentiator between the two business models that we're talking about here. And then, of course, the platform needs to be customer aware. Cohorts of customer segments are no longer enough today to actually ensure that we are providing the, the right kind of services to the customers. So this kind of individually crafted customer experiences, this kind of individually crafted product propositions are key for us on the long run to be relevant. In this note, actually, the way that we are looking at our channels and the way that we are actually engaging with our, uh, with our, with our customers can be described through three main pillars. First, we are aiming to drive customer engagement for our digital channels. So volume is important. We should never be afraid of volume. Volume of interaction, uh, in, in, intensity of interaction should actually be a gift because that volume drives insights, drives opportunities in the way that we can provide sales and services end-to-end -end in the digital service for our customers. So as the volume picks up this opportunity to understand the customer needs, to understand the customer behavior, obliges us to make sure that through the same channel, we can actually meet that expectation. We can make sure that customers have a relevant, complete user journey, customer experience, customer lifecycle. And eventually, you'll see much more of that actually coming maybe less from me, but from some of my colleagues that will be speaking in the next two days, like Katarina Herman, for instance, which, uh, which will be on the retail stage uh, later. This needs to be done in a way that the customer experience is actually the one that we feel 
uh, is the ING customer experience we want to have for our customers. Whatever products, services, and customers, to whatever volume of interaction of consumption, the the, the interface the interface with ING needs to feel the same. It needs to be rel- reflective what we, of our culture, of our brand, of our promise to you as a customers. So net promoter score and customer experience in itself is actually another very important dimension that actually fills. Uh, fills, fills this loop and actually uh, feeds into how we're making decisions on the customer engagement channels, on the types of products and services that we're pro- providing there. All in all, I think this sets a bit of the tone for the numbers that I'm going to share for you, with you. Basically, in a nutshell, these are probably some of the most relevant numbers of today. They are 2020 numbers. I tried to present to you as fresh of a picture possible, so you can call them year to date. They're relevant during the pandemic period. So what you see in front of you is actually some hard facts. We are, from a net promoter's perspective, the number one financial institution in Romania. This is something that we have as an objective and we're actively listening to our customers and adapting and responding in a way that we actually keep this perception and this promise for the future uh, at this stand, as this stands. We are not the largest bank in Romania. From a, from a perspective of the volume of assets, we are actually number four. And we've done this, we're, we've reached this point over more than 25 years of organic growth here in the market, staying true to what we believe is the right way to conduct our business. Then if you're talking about customer engagement, you see the kind of volumes that we're talking about. Only on home bank, year to date, there's around 180 million authentications. Uh, 95% almost of them coming from mobile. We've seen actually a shift, a, a tremendous shift from desktop to mobile actually in the past months. And this is why all of our products and services, we're designing them in such a way that they actually fit into your pocket. In September alone, we had about 20 authentications in an average per user. And we're talking about an active user base of more than a million customers. Uh, Year to date, if you look at the months previous to that, we've had in an average about 20 million authentications per month. And that in itself is around 150% more than we had in the similar months of 2019. August 2019 to August 2020 uh, met a a 50% growth and so forth. And 80% of our customers are actually connecting with us exclusively for mobile. Home bank is actually driving this kind of engagement. But when we're talking about products and services, I can only mention a couple of of them here. So from a payments perspective, at this point, one of two e-commerce transactions here in Romania are coming through us. And we all know how, this, how, how important this e-commerce dimension of the economy has become in this time, in this day and age. We have the right, highest rate of adoption uh, in Europe for the mobile payments platforms for ING Pay and Apple, and Apple Pay, which actually demonstrates that even compared to other economies in Europe, the appetite for this kind of capability is actually much higher in Romania than anywhere else. of the the payments that are processed through us are actually contactless. And the volume of payments that we process into the market is actually huge. Maybe the only number that I quoted here is a number from the Authority of Digitalization of Romania, which the leader of what which which you've seen actually a a moment ago, which actually stated that in Q4 2019, uh, ING Romania processed uh, 56% of the internet banking payments in Romania. And I specifically quoted this number pre-pandemic because the percentage and the intensity of this actually increased in the months since. From a sales perspective, today we are actually driving more than 20% of our sales exclusively for digital channels. If you took a look at specific products, personal loans being a very common product, 40% of them are done exclusively on digital. And from that, 90% is done from mobile, from your pocket. One of five Romanians actually took today, till day, today, this year, a personal loan with us. We had, because of the fact that we've created the end-to-end onboarding, even in January this year, prior to pandemic, we had more than 3,000 new relationships that have been exclusively opened up in the digital channel, 100% 
uh, year to date. And of course, when it comes to the way that we're actually interacting with you, one out of six Romanians actually have the recurrent income with ING, which actually means that we are building a much more meaningful relationship, one that we can actually understand the customer behavior, one in which we can quickly adapt, respond, and um, uh, provide opportunities for specific customer life events. On this note, I think there's a lot of more data that can come together with this, but, but the point is, I think, quite relevant. Digital, for at, for at least for our industry, is the only way today. And the numbers, the progressions year on year, which actually show on all types of products and services, increases of more than 50% of digital consumption, uh, I think are telling a very compelling story. Now, moving next, uh, this is probably a bit of the, the external interface, but let me also share a bit of how it is on the inside. Because I think, you, you remember in, in the opening, I was saying that safety has been paramount for our customers, for our communities, but not, not at all, at least for, for our employees. And the way that you perform digitally should not be looked at only from the customer perspective. It should also be assessed from how you're performing digitally on the inside, how you're performing your internal processes, how your workforce is actually equipped to operate in this kind of a landscape and is actually built to be the workforce for the future. In this pandemic time, of course, we moved to into work from home. In just a couple of days, we moved up to 95% of our work in this kind of a setup, and we've actually continued to do that ever since. We're still roughly around 95% in an average working from home across the entire organization. And we're doing everything right. There's no compromise on quality, on commitments that we make to customers, to regulatories, to regulatory bodies. We're actually getting the job done. It is, and we're running the, the business like we would have normally done. Only in IT, since March, we had 90 new colleagues joining us. And they've been onboarded and they've been welcomed in the organization in a fully remote way. We've had internship programs, of course, because we need to continue to, uh, to engage with the university environments. We need to continue to engage with the communities around us pretty much like we've done so f up till now, but even more importantly now. And all in all, if you look at the organization, the, the, we are actually asking the people um, in, in organization how they feel constantly. And we're trying to assess their state of mind, any uh, impediments that they have to do their jobs. Uh, and overall, the, what we call the organizational health index is actually at a historical high for us in the organization. Of course, there's the good and the bad of this period. So we asked the teams what these two are. So as you see, people feel that there is actually a bigger opportunity to, to achieve a better work-life balance, that they no longer have to do the commutes, which they had to do so far, that the collaboration and productivity are actually increasing because they're actually being able to focus more on the job at hand. But there's also some of the bad, of course. And as I was mentioning earlier, this type of digital transformation that we're going through takes a lot of empathy because there are implications, some of them profound, in the way we are operating and who we are. People miss their colleagues. People suffer because they don't have a dedicated workplace at home. Maybe in some cases they are interrupted by family members or uh, they feel that it's hard to work alone. Even in the way we work, we are very social. And we're listening to this kind of feedback and we're doing a lot of things. Here's some of the things that we're doing. I could tell you in a nutshell that basically we decided to build internally a social media platform that helps us drive this kind of interactions, engagements. One of the biggest dangers in working from home in this kind of environment is that interactions become very transactional. People don't get the chance to spend quality time together, to know themselves, to experience themselves outside of the things they really need to do. So we're creating the environment to do this. We're creating the environment for people to have fun together, to share experience like the work from home, work from isolation journal, to sing together like I just got talent events. Of course, we got also professionals which are showing us how to, do, to, to be done, not necessarily uh, because we, okay, we need to learn about that as well. Getting updates, getting information, getting perspectives, 
uh, donating, contributing to the communities. For instance, people are actually donating their playlists to, uh, to drive money for vulnerable groups fighting COVID. These are just some examples that every organization needs to cater to in this period in a digital manner in order for us to not lose who we are. On this note, um, let me only close this stage by saying that uh, it is important to emphasize the, the digitalization, not only looking at the customer, but only looking, also looking at the internals of the organization equally. Now, the next step I want to talk to you about is briefly, of course, is how do we operate? And I was saying that we actually do our thing the same way that we have been doing it all the way, always. And there's probably two key messages here around how we operate that I want to emphasize right now. First is the agile way of working. For a number of years, we've implemented that. And basically right now, we're actually seeing the benefits of this way of operating, of this way of thinking, of this way of uh, um, moving in this kind of uh, unpredictable times. Second, it's a very technical one. It is the concept of that platform that I mentioned to you that actually provides that layer of technical capabilities that allows us to adjust, innovate, scale in a secure and reliable way. And here's what I mean by these two things. Agile for us has been a journey. Uh, at the end of 2014, ING uh, globally was the first bank to adapt Agile as a way of working in the world. In 2017, this process actually kicked off also in Romania. So three years back, we started wrapping our head around this concept and really started operating it in a way that, okay, we're still improving it. We've still got important uh, efforts to make sure that we're adjusting, we're learning, and we're continuously improving the way that we drive this process. All in all, all majority of organization at this point is structured through tribes, which are, which are mapped against important themes of the bank. As you see, we're trying to have a, cor a clear correlation between what is important, the big themes, which can change maybe up to five year once every five years, into, into specific epics that we're focused on during, I don't know, periods of three to 12 months, into features and then stories, which are absorbed and um, processed at a sprint level. The tribes are actually cross-functional. There are tribes that map business skills, technical skills, project skills. You see product owners, scrum masters, all sorts of chapter leads and, uh, and experts which are involved into that. And of course, an agile coach, which is actually helping us stay true to the belief of agile. Constantly, the agile coach is actually working with all of the teams in these tribes to make sure that, that we are listening to them and we're constantly improving the process. The way that we operate sub, uh, subsequently is probably very familiar to, to a lot of you. The key is how do we map what we do at the squad level, at the sprint level, into the economies of scale that fall into place at the bank level. How this, all, all of this process is intertwined, so we are actually being able to coordinate very large-scale initiatives across multiple markets, not only domestically in Romania, into, to achieve these big important business outcomes. And that is the scale agile method that we call ourselves in, in ING, the agile one way of working. Ultimately, the reverse pyramid at the right, I think shows a bit what the mindset is. The mindset being customer over company, company over tribe, tribe over squad, squad over I. And of course, we're still improving it. Right now, we have more than 10 tribes currently operating in the bank. A good chunk of our organization is actually engaged into that. Uh, and we want to keep doing that. At the start of this year, we actually ran a survey asking senior leaders across the bank and even across the countries whether they want to change this way of working and get back to what we've been doing. Uh, I think the answer is clear. No, by no means. May, nothing, may, it may not be perfect, but it gives us the right tools to do the right things right. On this note, let me jo go next to one of these tools, because the tools itself actually have a lot to do also with technology. 
probably you all see and uh, acknowledge the history that some of us had to share a while back of this kind of building our products, solutions, and applications, right? Individual stacks that actually served specific business outcomes. In the meanwhile, some of these underlying layers of these stacks evolved into being provided as cloud proposition, uh, infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, etc. But the catch is, how do you also apply the same platform, the same cloud way of thinking, also to the business layers? And this is the platform, the, the power of the technical technology platform that we're building in ING, because it actually transcends the infrastructure platform, which we are actually building ourselves as a hybrid cloud setup. It adds to this an engineering platform that actually provides the tools of the trade for us to do cons consistently across organizations, across the world, the job. And actually, you'll, you'll see one of my colleagues actually later in one of the sessions specifically describing what we do for the CICD pipeline, for instance, in the bank across the world. And also takes this then at an application layer because the more we actually able to build this kind of reusable components, this kind of solutions that we can scale and stretch across geographies, the more we are actually able to put the power of Agile for us to be more than the sum of our parts. And on this note, this is what actually the thing implies. We need to operate as one technical organization, having a common purpose, a common backlog, a consistent workforce of talented engineers across the world. We have in, in ING across the world more than 12,000 engineers, 25% of all the employees in the bank. In Romania, it's still 25% of all the employees in the bank. And the 500 plus engineers that we have here are working closely integrated in processes and using these platforms with the broader populations across the globe. One agile way of working. This is how we are actually able to align all of these backlogs, all of these priorities, and execute these common, common purposes. And of course, one technology platform. And here are, at a very high level, some of the pieces of that technology platform. We're talking about infrastructure, but as well as engineering, as well as application building blocks, some related to data, some related to channel components, some related to how we're designing our middleware and integration. And all in all, eventually, this generates a consistent way for us to build APIs and devise and derive business propositions. All in all, this is actually the means through which we will be able, and we are able already, to operate as a platform that actually integrates and offers to our customers even products and services beyond the banking. And this leads us to the next topic of how we innovate. And bear in mind, all of these three, three things are well connected together because innovation is actually a thing that requires a specific type of process, a specific type of attention, but actually plugs in very well into the general agile way of working, into the platform concept, and basically how we perceive ourselves into the market. The way we innovate in ING is called PACE. It is a name for a process of innovation that we created ourselves. PACE actually means playfulness, acceptance, curiosity, and empathy. And the term comes from actually uh, child psychology and actually goes to the way of thinking required for us as an adult to create a safe environment for children to feel comfortable and start exploring. Take this and apply it to the concept of innovation and it will little, take us a lot away. Basically, the process has some stages. Of course, there is a discovery stage in which we do all sorts of customer interactions, market analysis, exploration of all sorts. We are looking at context, at challenges, at opportunities, and this creates some ideas. Of course, those ideas need to be perceived from a perspective of the problem fit, right? Because there's all sorts of validation processes that once we derive this inception process, we, we take these ideas from validating them into customer expectations. Is this answering your problem? Is this really addressing the opportunity? And basically figuring out how this problem fit is actually uh, adequate. Solution fit, then, okay, we look at the possible solutions to address that problem or that opportunity. 
even in the way that we some multiple solutions can come up to a similar outcome, the way that this fits into our uh, end result can be materially important. And therefore, it, it, it needs to be tackled correctly. And of course, market fit. Going to my previous point in the other uh, earlier, that when we're looking at market fit, we need to think past time to market, but at, from a perspective of time to scale. And of course, how do we actually scale it? What is its potential to grow? And how are we going to implement it? And this goes and feeds into our Agile one way of working. We're on a specific kind of stream that helps us iterate through such ideas, iterate through such solutions, understand whether they actually fit, are fit for purpose or not, understand how we need to actually stop some of the things that we're doing and focus on different things, and therefore iterate and produce the outcome that we're seeking for. The space process helps us align all of this inception process into our agile backlogs, being aware of all of the assumptions because it's a very open uh, topic. Therefore, there's a lot of known unknowns as well as unknown unknowns and articulating that and be able to understand the certainty and the effects of them is very important. But also then putting through our process, this, this helps us do the right things right cleaning up the backlogs of things that customers don't want, and actually deciding what we preserve or what we pivot out of, of the uh, innovation funnel, funnels that we have. Last but not least, as I was saying, this builds up to the Agile one way of working, the way that we are actually organized as an organization, and helps us to endorse, adopt, and contribute this, contribute to this in a systemic way. It would be enough to stop here, but the only thing I want to add is that the things are actually a bit more complicated than that. Because although this would be a, a very simple innovation and implementation process, the catch is that we are a bank and we have all sorts of processes, all sorts of diligences and regulations that we need to comply to. So this process actually helps us drive this in a way that these processes are accounted for. And when we have an outcome, this outcome is actually one that is bearing the right kind of seal for ING. The ideation process, as you see, can produce multiple propositions coming from interactions with customers. But then we're looking at the risks involved into this, at all the regulations landscape and how we need to map these ideas into the regulatory landscape. We're looking at the user experience and how this new idea actually links well to what the end-to-end -end journey of our customer in ING can be. When they're building controls to make sure that all of this landscape is well accounted for and the innovation that we're creating is actually one that is adequate for the purpose. Of course, behind it, we have a technology foundation, which we reuse whenever we start implementing that. The fact that we can actually focus on providing technical components from the technical foundation to support that idea actually helps it materialize faster. It goes then through testing, all sorts of iterations, of course, and eventually ends up into a production and maintenance life cycle, life cycle towards, you know, mapped towards other products and services that we have for you. And the end place for it is here. We are almost never bringing any of this kind of ideations that really don't, are not targeted for this kind of landscape. All in all, I think this creates a bit of a better understanding of all of this. Uh, stay tuned for another five of my colleagues that have actually a lot to, more to add on many of this later in these two days. There are technicals, technical people, very talented technical people, but also business people that you will not be able to tell apart from technical people too well. So thank you all and enjoy the next two days. Thank you very much. Thank you, Razvan.